Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. My name is Andrew Kircher, and I am the Director of Public Humanities and Research at Bard Graduate Center, a research institute dedicated to the study of human history through objects, through material culture, design history, and decorative arts. We're located on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenny Lenape. In our gallery, we currently are sharing two exhibitions that brilliantly capture what this institution does so well, Staging the Table, curated by Deborah Crone, and Shape by the Loom, curated by Hadley Jensen. Shape by the Loom is a unique research project since it has been explored across two curatorial modes. There's an in-person exhibition in our gallery space and a beautifully designed online exhibition, which we will explore and celebrate together today. We'll spend about 45 minutes navigating this digital exhibition and then reserve some time for questions. But now I will turn things over to curator Hadley Jensen and the director of digital humanities and digital exhibitions, Jesse Morandi. First, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'll just begin by giving a brief, um, a brief introduction to the project um, before turning it over to Jesse. Shaped by the Loom invites you to explore the world of Navajo weaving, highlighting Diné history, culture, and cosmology, as well as the localized and land-based knowledge systems that guide the process behind the finished product. Bringing together Diné weavers and visual artists with historical items from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, this exhibition presents weaving as an art form, a cultural practice, and a lived experience. This has been a collaborative initiative from the beginning, and we'd like to extend our thanks to Dean Peter Miller and director Susan Weber for their ongoing support of this project, as well as the staff of the American Museum of Natural History. In particular, Peter Whiteley, Laurel Kendall, Kristen Mabel, Mary Lou Murillo, and Barry Landua. We offer a special thanks to our design partners at CHIPS, Dan Shields and Adam Squires. At Bard Graduate Center, we would like to thank the Director of Focus Project Exhibitions, Nina Stritzler-Levine, Catherine Atkins, Alexis Muha, Helen Polson, Ellie Hughes, Aaron Glass, Laura Gray, and Julie Fuller. We'd like to recognize and thank Shaped by the Loom project collaborators and contributing artists, Kevin Aspis, Raphael Begay, Melissa Cody, Barbara Teller Ornelas, Linda Teller Pete, Larissa Nez, Darby Raymond Overstreet, and Tyrell Tapaha, as well as Jackson Clark, John McCulloch, Howard and Judy Rowe, Sue Burry, Jeannie Braco, and Jack Towns. Finally, this project is dedicated to the memory of Ira Jackness, who is a dear friend, colleague, and mentor. He passed away in 2021, before the project was completed, and we're honored to be able to publish the essay that he contributed shortly before his death. And support for the digital exhibition has been provided by the YF Foundation for American Art. As Andrew briefly mentioned, Shaped by the Loom is more than one exhibition. It's both a broader curatorial framework and a methodology that strives to advance collaborative exhibition practices and enable new forms of scholarship, particularly in response to new digital platforms. It's structured as several distinct parts, all of which work in tandem to create a larger narrative about the histories, material cultures, and contemporary expressions of indigenous weaving traditions in the Southwest. Through its many components, we hope that you become acquainted with a living art form. Through the voices and stories of its individual makers, situated alongside the perspectives of scholars, students, conservators, conservators, curators, and dealers. 
Throughout the process of creating this exhibition, I began to recognize the practice of weaving as a way of making knowledge and as a mode of storytelling. Even if its capacity for holding and carrying such knowledge is variously conceived and understood. These connections between thinking, making, and knowing ultimately became the currents that molded the themes of this exhibition. Just to provide some context, Shaped by the Loom began in 2018 during my postdoctoral fellowship in museum anthropology, a joint appointment between Bard Graduate Center and the American Museum of Natural History. It evolved in part from a desire to provide a new thematic and interpretive lens for reconsidering the historic Navajo textile collection at AMH. Largely acquired by anthropology curators in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The challenges of mounting a physical display of these items alongside the uncertainties created by the COVID-19 pandemic prompted us to consider the advantages offered by an online platform. Although a virtual exhibition precludes the visitor's encounter with the physical object, it, give, it invites greater accessibility, reach, and longevity, which felt important to our overall aims. As these ideas developed, it became a more intellectually and curatorially expansive project, relying on several forms of media to tell these stories. By creating multiple pathways for the site visitor, we hope that this collaborative project will provide an immersive experience of the Navajo Nation and a larger cultural context for understanding Navajo weaving, specifically through a lens of indigenous aesthetics and languages of making. On view at Bard Graduate Center Gallery through July 9th, and then traveling to several other venues, the physical version of this exhibition provides the opportunity to explore the complementary possibilities of this project. Jesse, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Hadley. As Director of Digital Humanities and Digital Ex Exhibitions, I've been working to develop approaches to decorative arts, design history, and material culture here at Bard Graduate Center that leverage emerging digital tools and methodologies to support the creation and investigation of new modes of scholarship in human science. Although it is now serving a dual role as a gallery interactive, Shape by the Loom was originally imagined as our first born digital focused project exhibition, an online version of the small scale gallery exhibitions conceived and developed through faculty, student and staff collaborations. As with each of these exhibitions, no one is alike and each presents its own unique opportunities and challenges. Throughout the presentation today, we will show you some of the ways in which we utilize this digital platform to explore the world of Navajo weaving, addressing the key concepts, historical context, as well as the makers, processes, and materials behind these incredible textiles. We will walk you through the organization of the site, its main interactive features, and some of the design and technical choices behind its development. We invite you to explore this world with us. Please browse along as we celebrate the official launch of Shape by the Loom. And I think you'll be able to find that link in the chat if it's not there already. We'd like to first welcome you to the homepage of the Shape by the Loom site. Hadley's gonna tell you a little bit more about the organization and its relationship to um, Navajo dye charts. So a Navajo dye chart, which we'll be seeing in more detail later, is the map for the guided journey of this virtual exhibition. And here you'll see in the center a loom portrait by Danae artist Darby Raymond Overstreet. A kind of visual index or ecosystem of Navajo weaving and miniature, it became the conceptual architecture for the site's homepage. 
This web-like chart creates nonlinear connections that offer various routes for navigating exhibition content. As you can see here from the home page, there are several directions which you can go to uh, through to explore the exhibition content. Along the, the outside surrounding the center portrait are six themes, which you'll see above and below the portrait. Homeland, creation, cosmology, ecology, dyeing and coloring, techniques and technologies, design elements, and value and exchange. On the sides of the portrait are three main essays, uh, one by Ira Jackness, one by Linda Teller P, and one by Hadley, and she'll speak more to those in a minute, and also a link to the Navajo textile collection of the American Museum of Natural History. At the top, you'll also see an alternate path for navigation, which you can open and close through the three line menu here. You'll see those same items which I just detailed listed separately um, stacked in the main drop down menu here. So you can browse either through the web like structure of the home page or you will always find this navigation um, at the top in this sticky menu. Um, and just to briefly mention the essay content that we're featuring, in addition to the voices of student curators and those of the Diné artists and scholars who have been our project collaborators, we're honored to include Linda Teller Peet's reflection on what process means in her own practice through an illustrated account of her family's deep history of weaving. A theoretical framework for the project is provided in my essay, Knowing, Making, Naming. And the late Dr. Ira Jackness details the institutional history of the AMNH's Navajo textile collection in his essay, the first study of its kind to be published on this historic collection. And it also serves as a complement to the online catalog. Returning to the home page, we're going to take a look at several of the theme pages. We won't go into them in very much detail. We would definitely love for you to explore each of those pages. We're just gonna give you an overview of the content that is similar on each of the pages so you get an understanding of how they're built and the thinking behind those pages. We're gonna start with the Homeland Creation and Cosmology page. Each thematic section linked from the die chart will explore important elements of Diné culture and textile production. Each section is broken into three main subsections or themes. Not just here. These are called in focus essays. Um, in addition, there are often on each of the pages learn more content, which expand a bit about the topics and the items which are in the featured section above. Several of the pages also, these major theme pages also have special interactive features which we will uh, revisit in a moment. I'd like to now go over to the dyeing and coloring page. You'll see the beautiful photography in the heading of each of these pages. Uh, these are contributions from Raphael Begay a uh, friend and collaborator who um, was essential to the project, both the exhibition in the gallery and to this digital project. You'll see his work throughout the pages of the site. And Hadley's gonna talk a little bit about one of the In Focus projects, uh, one of the In Focus essays. Um, this is just an example of um, one of the In Focus essays featuring an item from the American Museum of Natural History. Um, Jesse, can you scroll down? Yep. Um, you'll see that we also included um, Linda Teller Pete's uh, label from the gallery exhibition um, with a short reflection by Juliana Thagua Arias. 
Um, and if you keep going down, that wasn't anything with the learn more section, but um, hopefully you can spend some more time exploring all of these essays on your own. Um, like yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to also mention um, that some of these items include audio reflections from Danae Weaver and fiber artist Tyrell Tapaha. Um, these are also featured in the gallery with podcast interviews, artist bios, and videos. And these theme pages were initially developed in two graduate seminars at BGC. Um, one that I taught in spring 2020 and one that I co-taught with Professor Aaron Glass in spring 2021. Um, and teaching is a, a key component of exhibition making at BGC. So we're pleased to be able to feature this content that was researched um, and written about by, um, by our students. We'd like to recognize and thank each of these contributors, including Marion Cox, Natalie DeCordo, Juliana Fagua Arias, Emily Hayflick, Tova Kaddish, Rachel Schwabe, Danielle Weindling, Caleb Weintraub Weissman, Ashley Williams from Columbia University, Alice Winkler, and Jessica Young. Please take as much time as you want after we have concluded this talk, looking through each of these incredible essays in these sections. I particularly am fond of the modern artists and makers that we have included. Um, these sections bring some of the, the modern artists who continue the heritage of Navajo weaving in new and exciting ways. Um, we have photographers, digital artists, and uh, weavers. So please take uh, time to view all these incredible works. Now we're going to visit um, several of the incredible um, interactive features that we conceived and developed for this project. One of the things we were really excited about was how we could leverage digital tools in order to uh, address several of the things that we knew were kind of missing if you were just looking at the objects. And a central component of that was creating a, a sense of place and bringing the visitor as best we could through our digital tools to the Navajo Nation um, in order to really get a better understanding of the landscape that both inspires and is the um, is where all of the resources come for the weaving for these projects um, traditionally. So let us uh, take a look at the Navajo Nation um, interactive. This interactive features eight locations, as you'll see here marked uh, on the map. You'll also see that the map is devoid of the traditional markings of a map, except for the state markers, which uh, help to give an understanding of the location of the Navajo Nation. Um, so you are free to browse through these eight different markers. Uh, we have Window Rock, Navajo Tribal Park, Spider Rock, Canyon de Shea, uh, National Monument, Monument Valley Tribal Park, Shiprock Pinnacle, Tisnas Pass Trading Post, Muley Point, Mexican, which is in Mexican Hat, Utah, and Rapley Ridge, which is also in Mexican Hat, Utah. And finally, we have Hunter's Point and Oak Springs in Arizona. Aside, um, selecting one of the eight locations, and we're going to start with um, Window Rock, which was, um, which you can Jesse. see here. Yeah, jump in, Hadley. Jesse, if you want to take people through the 360 demo, I can pick up. Great, go for it. Um, so selecting one of the eight locations reveals a panel that displays the place names listed first in Diné Bizad, the Navajo language, followed by their English translations. And our goal is to reintroduce and reactivate Navajo terms and place names that are culturally significant 
and related to the themes of the exhibition. Here related specifically to geography and cosmology. We feature brief descriptions of each location with 360 views as you see right now and supplemental photography by Raphael Begay and Jesse Mirandi. So the 360 documentation was created in October 2021 by a small project team um, that included Jesse Mirandi, Byron Flesher, Raphael Begay, and myself. And our idea was to, to try to place site visitors within these locations, providing a more immersive experience of the Navajo Nation. And for visitors to our gallery, um, you will also encounter this, these stunning panoramic views um, presented or accompanied by a soundscape that was commissioned for the exhibit um, by Dene pianist and composer Connor Chi. And I just wanted to read a, a quote that um, Raphael Begay contributed, um, which you can also see on the, this page. Our intention was to provide an immersive entry point to Deneta, as well as to make visible the connection between homeland and Dene textiles, creativity, thought, and being. As a photographer, visiting these locations has always been a way to activate my attention to the details of a landscape, helping to draw my gaze to the many layers, shapes, surfaces, and textures around me. It is an active learning experience that transforms physical spaces into sites of curiosity, inquiry, and wonder. We encourage you to contemplate the connection and relationship between each of these elements and the makers and textiles featured throughout the project. And finally, we offer this project to the Diné community as a way to position themselves and their surroundings and in the world. It's a way to acknowledge the importance of our homeland as a source of pride, hope, and identity as well as our connection and responsibility to one another. And I also wanted to mention um, the importance of doing this work in a non-extractive way, and in thinking about questions of research ethics, accessibility, and reciprocity. We're also exploring ways to make this content available to the Navajo Nation's Department of Tourism. And lastly, support for this project, um, the 360 component in particular, was provided by NYU Gallatin Wet Lab with a film and photography permit approved by Navajo Nation TV and Film. Next, we are going to jump over back to the dye chart, uh, the, sorry, the dyeing and coloring page. Here you'll see one other, um, I just love this interactive feature, which um, as Hadley mentioned, the, the information architecture and interface design largely is borrowed from this idea of the web-like structure of the Navajo dye chart. Um, but we also use the Navajo dye chart in this interactive experience as a way to learn more about the plants which are used for the actual dyeing of the uh, yarn for that is used in the textile. So I'm going to pop over here and you'll see in the dye chart there are links between the plants and the small piece of yarn goes to the mini loom in the middle and you can see that each of these kinds of gives you an idea of the coloring that the different uh, plant will generate. So I'm going to show you just a couple of these. And once again, we invite you to explore these pages in more detail. On each of, um, not every page has dye recipes. We were able to pull dye recipes where we were, when we were able to, we in would include those. And you can see here on the left, the dye recipes. This is a wood lichen recipe. However, um, we have also found this ground lichen, which was also used in dyeing processes here. 
Um, so we also feature the botanical, uh, the botanical name and the Navajo name of the plant. And we also have included uh, representative um, specimen collections from uh, various locations. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple more. We have the, um, sorry, I missed. Jesse, while you're pulling that up, yeah. um, I, I'll mention that all the recipes were taken from um, two publications, Navajo Native Dyes, Their Preparation and Use by Stella Young and Nonaba Bryan, and Native Dye Plants by Isabel Discini. And both publications were written by Dene Weavers and Natural Dye Practitioners. And the dye chart itself was made by Rosalind Washburn um, and gifted by John McCulloch, owner of Tisnaspas Trading Post for the exhibition. And this dye chart is featured in the gallery as well. So we take you now to the final section of the website and undoubtedly one of the inspirations for much of the work we did in the project. Um, clicking from the homepage once again, or the main menu, I'll just jump back there. You'll find the link down here on the left. And uh, when you click that, you'll be greeted with a little bit of background information about the collection and the uh, uh, what exactly we have included here. You'll also be able to search um, by these the following search criteria, accession date, the donor, um, textile type, period, and technique. So by just clicking, for instance, on the accession date, you can see that we have um, instances dating back to the 19th century. So clicking on that will hide the other items in the collection. And basically what you're presented with is the, an image of the item in the collection and um, some more details um, related to the specific objects. So I'll just click on one more here. If, for instance, if you search for a double weave pattern, you'll see the reduced selection here. And then finally, if I just go back to the main collection or to a collection with more items in it, this one has 46. You can also hide um, by the items in the exhibition. Um, so you see these ones do not have, <laughs> I'm selecting the wrong ones here. So for instance, this item here, which is um, this one particular item is featured in the exhibition. So uh, this is a great way to explore some of the objects. If you are visiting our galleries, you can revisit those objects in the collection, or you can also explore this wonderful wealth of information about this collection and browse these incredible textiles. And um... We would encourage you to read the essay by Ira Jackness, which provides um, context for understanding the formation of this collection at AMH. Um, it has collectors bios, and he spent about three years doing research in the AMH anthropology archives. Um, for anyone who knew him, he was methodical in his research. So. Um, we're really pleased to be able to feature that um, online. And um, we also, you know, would direct you to AMNH's collections database. Um, we used that to create our own filter mechanism, um, but just created different um, criteria, different categories for being able to search through this collection. Um, and a special thanks to our contributor for this section, um, Mary Lou Marillo, um, Senior Museum Specialist for Textiles at AMH, who played a big part in helping to create this um, feature. Um, I think that that's all we wanted to cover today. Um, in, in concluding, I'll just mention that we really conceived this site to be a kind of living extension of the exhibition. 
Um, so we'll be adding an educator's guide, uh, which will be free to download, um, an exhibition resources PDF that accompanies the gallery exhibition, and links to a podcast series produced by our former students and BGC alums, Jessica Young and Juliana Fagua Arias. So we hope that you enjoyed our quick tutorial and we have some time for questions. So I'd like to welcome Andrew back um, and he'll help us to moderate the Q&A. Thanks, Hadley. Um, so uh, there are so many of you here today, 150. Uh, and so in the spirit of generosity, uh, all that we ask is that, um, that you ask questions and if you have uh, comments, uh, observations, save those for the end. You can also uh, follow up with us. Um, but so that we can get through the questions really quick, please just jump straight to the question. And I'll model. Uh, so I'll first ask uh, Jesse and Hadley, what can a digital exhibition do that an in-person can't? How did this experiment extend or expand your thinking about curation? Jesse, do you want to start and I'll... Yes, absolutely. I, I think one of the things that was really important was to, to create this interlinking between the objects, the place, the makers. And so a digital platform is just based, basically any web-based platform has that great associative property where we can create those direct links. So in a gallery where everything is set up in a, a distinct way, a website lets you reconfigure that organization and continue to really firsthand experience those interconnections. And I think that's a really powerful part of what we were thinking about when we were exploring the Navajo weavings um, was how to make those connections visible and to make a lot of the processes and materials behind their creation visible as well. So for me, I really feel like a digital platform allows you that space to uh, create a, a, also a user guided experience where a user can follow the content leads that they want and explore this world. But we tried to do our best job to create many pathways and to try to make visible those interconnections. Thank you. Um... All right, so if anyone else has questions, you can use the Q&A function right there at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a couple of questions right now. So first, um, uh, there was a question uh, as to whether uh, cochineal ap appears in the die chart, uh, and if not, why not? And, um, and maybe you can also share a little bit about cochineal, the, the, the bug that is used in red dye. Um, great point. And die charts don't, um, I, I guess they're not comprehensive um, and they don't feature all the natural dye sources that are used in Diné textiles. Um, but if you are able to spend some time in the dyeing and coloring section, um, you'll find, find out much more about cochineal in particular, as well as indigo and Germantown yarn. Right. Um, we have another question, uh, which is where will the exhibit, and I, I think in this case we mean the in-person exhibit that that is a perfect complement to the online one, when uh, and where will it be seen when it leaves Bard Graduate Center? Um, thank you for that question. So um, it's on view at, at Bard Graduate Center through July 9th, and then it's traveling to the Fenimore Art Museum in Cooperstown, New York. Um, for fall of 2023, and the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C. for fall of 2024. And we are pursuing one additional venue um, that has yet to be confirmed. Um, but hopefully, for those of you who have missed it in New York, you can um, explore the, the digital exhibition, of course, um, but hopefully see it as it travels. Um, great. Uh, and this is a technical question. Can everything that we've seen today be used on an iPad? Um, thanks for that question. I, 
the site is responsively designed, you should be able to view all parts of the site without problem, including the 360 content and the die chart. Um, experiences will vary, of course, across screens. We've done our best to make it with our partners, Chips, who are just outstanding developers and designers. We have tried to test and debug anything that um, didn't operate as expected. So we hope that that experience is similar across devices from handhelds to the large screen we have in our gallery, although they will vary from device to device. Thanks, Jesse. Um, another question. Uh, during the course of your research, how much time did you physically spend uh, visiting the Navajo Nation uh, sites, either the ones represented or other ones, and or working alongside or, or um, consulting with weavers? Um, thank you for that question. I would say um, it, this has been uh, this process has, or this exhibition has been um, basically a five year project um, beginning in 2018. Um, but before that, um, I spent quite a bit of time on the Navajo Nation in particular um, through my dissertation work um, at Bard Graduate Center and um, have since moved to Santa Fe. Um, so I am often there. Um, many of our collaborators are based in that area, um, Raphael Begay in particular. And for the 360 documentation project that we mentioned, um, we were constrained by ongoing COVID um, limitations. And so that trip was about a week um and had had been planned for six months i think prior to um our trip in october of 2021 um but yeah it's it has been um a very collaborative project from the beginning um and our our collaborators are everywhere from Tucson to Denver to Window Rock to Chimayo. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Another question. Uh, how many pieces, how many items are in the digital exhibition and how many in the in-person exhibition? Um, I'll take that one as well. Um, so these, these were designed to be separate but related projects. And so there's overlap in content. Um, there's certainly an overlap in concept and in the thematic framework. Um, we chose slightly different pieces for the gallery exhibition, many of which are featured in the In Focus essays online. Um, but for those of you who may have been to our gallery, it's a, a, a small and very intimate space. And we were working with um, many very large weavings. So we have about um, 18 pieces from the AMH collection in the gallery um, with a selection of contemporary works. And then we were able to feature much more online, which is one of the benefits of having um, this digital resource. Uh, is the website accessible indefinitely? What a what a tough question. Well, our hope is that this project will last as a kind of archive of the exhibition, but uh, we're hoping, you know, we will continue to add. I'm seeing a lot of amazing suggestions from the, um, in the chats as well. So thank you for those. Um, some of them are asking questions, is there, but they are things, there are many things that we have been trying to do to be reactive and flexible in our design and the development of the site. We started with a very kind of set idea of what we wanted and that evolved over time as we met more people, we had more interactions with weavers and conversations 
we tried to shift our focus to put a lot more um, a lot more uh, commentary from Navajo weavers in their words. Uh, we tried to include a lot more Navajo language in the project as well. So we've been trying to address a lot of feedback we've gotten and we are definitely um, hoping that this continues to live for a long time as a resource for classrooms, for research, um, and for other weavers and makers. And I will say, um, I did. I saw a few questions about this background. This was done by the amazing Darby Over Raymond Overstreet, who is an, a digital artist. You can find information about her in the design section, uh, theme section of the site. She combines digital photography as well as imagery from um, AM H collection and other textile collections and combines them into these incredible uh, pieces. Uh, she also takes those pieces and actually weaves them into a loom, which the centerpiece, uh, which you can see on display at the Bard Graduate Center right now, um, is a really incredible example. That, that piece is called Passage. And these are called woven landscapes. So I'm going to duck out for a second so you can see the full. <laughs> That's as far for, as I can. For textile nerds out there um, in the Zoomscape, um, what she used um, as the background for the sky is the Germantown Eye Dazzler uh, from the AMH collection. Um, she uses a lot of historical rug designs and patterns. Um, in these digital collages. And the, the eye dazzler itself is in our gallery exhibition. So it creates so many incredible visual connections. She combines photography with digital printmaking. Um, she has a great website if you're interested in learning more about her work. Uh, one question that we received uh, uh, is in response to the train, uh, the, the the weaving that that depicts trains, and and is asking, are there other examples of unexpected juxtapositions that that challenge conventional imagery and and evoke sort of new meanings, new ideas? Um, that is such an interesting question, and um, that piece in particular um, is one, not that I have a favorite, but I do, I do like that one. Um, and one of our former students wrote about that piece um, online, and I think that we address many of those questions through the exhibition and interpretation itself. Um, I think one of our goals in, in the exhibition in general was to bring a new interpretation to um, this historic collection, um, specifically through the perspectives of Diné textile artists, um, many of whom have written about their own works, but have also chosen items from the AMH collection um, to write about. And we're migrating some of that content from the gallery online. Um, but if you have the opportunity to, to come to our gallery, um, you'll see many of those um, reflections incorporated into the exhibition interpretation. I had seen a question also about whether, whether I'm a weaver. Um, I'll just quickly answer that I am not a weaver, um, but I, I have taken a, a weaving workshop um, with fifth generation um, Diné textile artists, Linda Teller Pete and Barbara Teller Ornelas. And this was a suggestion um, from Anne Headland years and years ago. Um, to take a weaving workshop when I was working on my dissertation um, to, to get some kind of hands-on and embodied experience of this process. Um, and so Linda and Barbara have been curatorial advisors um, for the exhibition since the project began in 2018. 
Um, they've been involved in collections visits at AMH, um, have helped us to plan wonderful programs that we've been doing all spring, um, have advised us on installation and design, and have also contributed to interpretation. Um, so we're very grateful for their part in this. One of our guests uh, asked whether there was a legend to, to point to or sort by different um, uh, iconography. Um, and I think that speaks to what Jesse was saying earlier, that there are so many different ways to use digital technologies to, to sort and traverse. And, and so another guest asked if, if you had more time and resources, what is something that you might have added to this digital exhibition? Oh, the dream question. Um, I, I, I know, and I see who answered, who asked that, and it was <laughs> um, a very good question. Jesse, you, you, you go first. I'll start, but I really wish we had had more time to uh, work with the uh, modern artists um, and to have spent more time on the Navajo Nation, because I think that for me, being able to go there and experience the place was transformative as a life experience. Um, it really helped me to understand the, the textiles, the process, and so much that you couldn't even fit into, the, uh, into a written project or into a web-based project. It just was, I think, to be able to include more um, about the natural resources. We met people along the way and we were trying to fit as much of that in as we went along, as I said, to try to be uh, open to the experience and how it unfolded. But it really was at a certain point, we had to make certain determinations about where, unfortunately about where to kind of cut off the scope so that we could finish the project. So with more time, it would have been great to add more visual resources to have visited more sites. I think um, the sites we visited uh, that are on the map are kind of a bunch of them are show stopping spaces, um, which when you're there are just unbelievable. But it really everywhere you turn, you could see the inspiration. And those are sometimes in just what you might just overlook as a mundane landscape. And so I'd like to have included some more of those kind of um, sites that were just in the towns and in the places where people work and live as well. Hadley, can you tell us, you have, in addition to Shape by the Loom uh, at BGC and Shape by the Loom Digital and the tour of Shape by the Loom, you have another exhibition coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I see there was a question about that as well. Um, I am co-curating um, an exhibition called Horizons, Weaving Between the Lines with Diné Textiles um, with Raphael Begay. And that will be opening at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe in July, uh, July 16th. Um, and it, we've, we've been working um, with a Diné advisory committee for that exhibition. Um, many overlaps in the people involved. I mean, both of these projects have really um, been built on relationships and um, we're excited to be um, opening this exhibition in Santa Fe. Um, so for any of you out there who might be closer um, to New Mexico, we hope that you'll um, see that one. So was there anything that surprised you? Anything that you learned uh, about weaving, about Navajo and Diné culture, history, uh, as you were researching and, and even as you were developing this platform, this mode of uh, exhibition? Um, I'll jump in and then Hadley, I, I'm sure you have lots to offer. I, I, I felt like we had a, I, I learned about Navajo time, which was incredible. There is a definite slowness um, where things are appreciated. Time is, feels different on the Navajo nation. And I felt like it was, it was eye-opening to take that moment 
And often we were given those moments to um, stop, look, pay attention, think about our connections to one another, to the land. And so, you know, living in New York City, it's easy to overlook those connections. And I was really grateful for that. And it, like I said, it was transformative experience. And the other thing is just seeing how vibrant and alive the Navajo weaving tradition is today with the um, modern artists we work with. Just incredible to see the different ways that those traditions are either being upkept or uh, reimagined in new kinds of work. So that was, those were really incredible experiences for me. Hadley, how about you? I'm always being surprised. Um, I mean, I think um, this, you know, because of the pandemic, um, this project went entirely online and allowed us to kind of think in new directions about um, the advantages of a digital platform. And then the opportunity came around to, to do a gallery exhibition alongside this digital project. Um, and I think having that additional time um, really strengthened the project in so many ways. Um, and allowed us to really take more time to think about what, um, what we could do differently with an exhibition on Navajo weaving. Um, and I think there was also a question about the future of this art form. And as Jesse said, um, many of the artists whose work um, we're featuring online and in the gallery are doing such innovative, interesting work um, that does reimagine Navajo weaving through different media, um, in particular the work of, of Darby Raymond Overstreet. So I think that's always, um, I don't know that it's surprising, but it's really exciting. Um, to have the opportunity to work directly with artists. Um, as a curator, I think that's one of the great joys of doing this kind of work. Um, it is kind of like storytelling through space and um, to be able to work side by side with artists to think about how to display their work in new ways um, is really exciting. One of our guests asked whether this exhibition focuses exclusively on uh, uh, Dene weavers and weaving um, and, and the history uh, or, or whether there are other uh, groups represented. Um, and I thought that this might be a good moment for you to share also a bit about the, the theme of intercultural exchange that um, organizes some of the exhibition. Um, another great question. Thank you for that. Um, the exhibition is focused on Dene weaving um, in part because specificity of place felt really important to the themes of this exhibition. Um, but we do have two um, Pueblo textiles, um, a Hopi manta from the AMH collection and a contemporary um, Pueblo dance kilt and sash um, made by Isabel Gonzalez. And we also have an incredible uh, Mexican serape in the gallery exhibition. Um, and you can see that online. Um, so we do talk about the importance of intercultural exchange and adaptation in the region um, historically, but also how that has affected um, contemporary weaving practices. Great. Right. Um, we're gonna come to a close now. I'm so thankful for uh, this time and, and being able to see this digital exhibition. Thank you, Hadley, thank you, Jesse, and thank you to the, the many, many people who joined us for this walkthrough. Um, I hope that you'll continue to follow BGC's exploits. Uh, we have several uh, uh, beautiful uh, digital representations. Not, it, as Jesse said, this is our first digital first exhibition, but there are so many other ways 
that you can navigate our exhibitions online. Um, you can also visit our gallery on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and you can watch our videos on YouTube. Um, we make available videos for most of our public programming. Uh, and so I, I hope that we'll see you all again soon in some way, online or in person soon. Um, but thank you again. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Hadley. Thank you all. Thank you.